Well, good morning and Merry Christmas once again. This morning we're going to have several texts to, to read through. Um, it'll be Matthew 1, 18 through 25, and I'm sorry I did not write down the pages in the Pew, Pew Bible, but Matthew 1, 18 through 25, Isaiah 7, verse 14, and then Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. We'll begin with Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25. And I will be reading from the ESV. If you were able, please stand for the reading of God's word. Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And now we get to our text for the day. Isaiah 9 verses 6 and 7. Who was this Emmanuel? Who was this one conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary? For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end, on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray. O oh Lord, by the riches of your glory, may you grant that we be strengthened with power by your Holy Spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. In being rooted and grounded in love, we may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge in the preaching of the word of the living God. That as we meditate upon the glory of the incarnation, God made flesh, that you will fill our hearts to overflow with the praise of you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And again, if you have your Bibles with you this morning and haven't already, as we were just reading, I would invite you to turn with me to Isaiah 9. And we'll be looking almost exclusively at verse 6 this morning. And in that, namely, at the title given to our Lord, El Gibor, the Mighty God. And that because on this glorious Lord's Day morning, when the holiday and a day in which we are not required to meet as a body, body, wonderful as it is, I love Christmas. The celebration of the incarnation of Christ is a wonderful thing to celebrate. But it is the day of the week that we are to come together and worship God. And they align today. 
which only happens about once every five or six years. And I think it's vital for us to understand who it is that we are worshiping every Lord's Day, and especially on this Christmas morning. And who is it that we worship? We worship El Gabor, the mighty God. Now you may be wondering why I'm choosing to focus on this specific title of all of those listed in Isaiah 9. Well, in case you haven't heard, there's been a bit of controversy surrounding Christmas this year within the church. But to explain it as quickly as possible, there were churches all over the country who actually decided not to have service this morning. And why did they decide to do this? The reasoning is so that families can spend time together on Christmas. So, of course, we have to ask the question, if this is why you closed your church on the Lord's Day, then who or what are you really worshiping? An idol? Possibly. Because even those things that the Lord has given us for good can be idols, including our families. Because if we focus this morning, if our focus this morning was to spend time gathered around a Christmas tree opening presents, then at a minimum, we have forgotten that the real tree of Christmas was decorated with the bruised and pierced body of the Messiah. And that should be our focus this morning, because that is who we worship. Now, keeping that in mind, there are three things I want us to consider on this Lord's Day morning. First, as I believe I would be negligent in my calling as one charged to speak the truth of Scripture to both the church and the culture, in other words, I think I would be uh, ignoring the prophetic calling of this office. I want to consider that those who will not submit to the mighty God are not Christians. I know that's a bold statement, and I'll explain shortly. Second, that the mighty God is inherently glorious. And finally, that Christ is proven to be the mighty God. Now, there may be those who are curious as to why I've chosen to focus on these elements, especially the first topic, rather than taking a more traditional road with this Christmas sermon. And I answer, that's precisely the point. It's precisely the point. This is only secondarily a Christmas sermon. Wonderful as Christmas is. The primary reason we are meeting today is because it is the Lord's Day. Now, there is no direct command, no prescriptive statement in Scripture that says you will meet on Sunday. End of point. But it is implicit in the text in Acts, the church gathered on the Lord's Day to worship him specifically. So while I will speak of the wonder of the fulfillment of this prophecy in Isaiah 9 as it relates to the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity, because it is Christmas Day after all, for the most part, we're going to look at this text as if it weren't Christmas. Uh, Christmas. In other words, how does this text impact our lives in light of the world and culture around us? But before we really get into the meat of the sermon, I want to clarify a few things about the title El Gabor here in verse 6. So the term here used for God, El, is taken from the Hebrew word, word, root word, which in this context, as I understand it, signifies above all else, strength. And so perhaps a literal translation of just that word El by itself might be the strong one. Or better, again in this context specifically, the strong God. Although it is often, if not exclusively, translated as God throughout the scriptures. But then added to this word El is this adjective in the Hebrew which expresses mightiness. That being Gibor. And so taking the two together, there's a clear expression of the omnipotence of Christ. 
in this title, El Gabor. His real deity, and therefore his omnipotence, as standing first and foremost among those attributes which the prophet spoke of him in this text. And so with that understood, we see this translated here in the ESV, and every, indeed every other translation that I checked, and I checked quite a few, uh, they either translated as mighty God or the mighty God. Now, I'm not going to attempt this morning to enter any, into any argument concerning the proof of the divinity of Christ, and that because the text itself doesn't demand it of us. The text does not say that Christ shall be the mighty God, although that is explicitly affirmed in many other places in Holy Scripture, and I believe it is implied here in this text as well. But rather, what it actually says is he shall be called, he shall be called Wonderful Counselor called Everlasting Father, called Prince of Peace, and called El Gibor, the Mighty God. So I think then that we may be excused from entering into that debate, or the proof of that specific fact this morning. If, if we are able to establish the truth of that which is actually prophesied here by Isaiah. And what is that? What is that prophecy? That Christ shall be, and in extrapolating that into the last days, is in fact called to this very day and for all eternity, the mighty God. So that being said, let's look first at the sad reality that those who will not submit to the mighty God are not Christians. So what do I mean by this statement? As I said before, it is a bold statement. Well, it's simply this. It's the height of foolishness when those who profess to be disciples of Christ do not and will not call him God, the mighty God, by refusing to submit to his commands. Unfortunately, this has already been brought to the forefront of the cultural conversation over the last couple of years regarding the closing of churches and that often under a supposed legal obligation. And in full transparency, we here at Westminster did close our doors for a bit. I think for about two months, it may have been a little longer than that. I didn't go back and check. But eventually we made the decision to open our doors while others did not. And we made that decision here because we believe that scripture is clear regarding one simple command, that the people of God must worship him and we must worship him together as the people of God and the question was often asked then by the media by other Christians by those we knew who aren't Christians whether family friends in fact I was asked this at work and almost almost verbatim how is it that we could be so unloving as to insist that we keep the churches open at such a dire time how could we be so unchristian when so many are concerned about their health, etc.? Now, I'm not trying to open the old wounds here. I'm not trying to be controversial just for the sake of being controversial. Or I'm not trying also to second guess any decisions that were made then, whether it was by us or by anyone else. It was, especially in the beginning, an unusual situation, and I think, at least at the beginning, that each church was attempting to make prayerful decisions with very little information. But, I do not think, beloved, that it is a coincidence that having willingly closed the doors of their churches, in some cases for over a year, we are now seeing many of those same churches willing to close their doors this morning. Why? Again, what is their reason? so that people can spend time with their families. Now, I see a few problems with this reasoning, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, but I'll mention a few of these problems from lesser to greater. First, to close the doors of churches this morning, to go back to that question that we were often asked, is incredibly unloving to those who don't have families to spend time with. I mean, aren't we 
those adopted by God as sons, members of one family. And for many in the church, this is their only family. So how unloving to isolate them by choosing to close your doors this morning. Second, how unloving is it to deny the preaching of the gospel? Not only the preaching of the gospel to those who are saints, but to the preaching of the gospel to those who may have heard it this morning in those churches if their doors were not closed. In other words, what about those unbelievers who, as is well known, may only attend church once or twice a year, Christmas probably being the most likely day of all, especially when it falls on Sunday. What are we showing them? What do we show the world when we cannot bother to show up and worship God on the Lord's Day because we'd rather spend time with our families? Again, are we not spending time with our families right now? I see whole families sitting in our pews, and we are all one family. What does this refusal to open up our doors say about the one we worship, the mighty God? Which leads me to the third observation. I believe that this choice is because they either do not recognize or possibly do not believe that the one we are commanded to worship is El Gabor. The mighty God that we are commanded to worship him first and then spend time with our family and friends those by the way whom he gave us in the first place now this is only one example of disobedience that is so often flaunted by many in the church today but it is quite a significant form of defiance and what I say now I say with a heaviness of heart Beloved, we cannot exchange Christian greetings with those who deny by their own actions, by their disobedience this morning, that Jesus Christ is the mighty God, who alone is worthy of worship. In other words, those who will not submit to the mighty God are not Christians, or at least we cannot presume so. And I don't speak necessarily of those individuals who have no choice because they're sitting in the pews. I'm primarily speaking of those in my position. We can't treat them like they are Christians, no matter how loudly they may claim otherwise. So what do we do? Do we shun or mock them mercilessly? Well, unfortunately, that seems to be the response of many, including myself, when I first started hearing these rumors on social media. But no, beloved, that's not how we should respond. So what do we do? We preach them the gospel. What does every sinner need? What do we need every time we sin, even though we're in these, this, this church this morning? We sin regularly. What do we need? We need the gospel. And they need the gospel. They need to hear the gospel and why we are here, sitting in these pews, in this building on Christmas morning, we should be proclaiming the gospel to each other. Because to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. As we continue on through that text, it ends. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And he has. Beloved, the zeal of the Lord of hosts has done this. All that was prophesied. To paraphrase Gregory of Nyssa, El Gabor, the mighty God, entered into human weakness without ceasing to rule the world and all that he made. He is the mighty God. And he did it in the person of Jesus Christ, conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Why? To save his people from their sins. How glorious 
is this gospel for them. And those who have chosen to close their doors this morning need to hear that glorious good news. Because it is glorious. In fact, there is an inherent glory in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which leads me to our next point. The inherent glory of the mighty God. In Isaiah 9, the prophet says that Jesus will be called El Gabor, the mighty God. And by that, I do not think that Isaiah means by a mere utterance of that phrase. It's much more powerful than that. Because we do so, we, we call him this, we call him the mighty God in much more potent and meaningful ways. Because as I believe we've just shown, our actions speak louder than our words. So how do we show that Jesus is El Gabor, the mighty God? Well, I believe that we show it in the fact that it is our delight and our joy and our privilege to attribute to him the attributes of deity as well as the office of mediator. And we see a couple of the attributes and that office right here in Isaiah 9. First, we see the omniscience of Christ in the title, Wonderful Counselor. And do we not turn to him time and again precisely because he is all-knowing and therefore perfectly wise? We read his infallible and, in and inerrant word knowing that he will guide us, instruct us, counsel us as we do, and this in his most wonderful wisdom. Second, we see his eternality in the title, Everlasting Father. I don't have time to go into the specifics of what it means that he's called Everlasting Father. That's for a whole other sermon on another day. But in hours of meditation and prayer, how often do we look up to him as being the eternally begotten Son? As you and I sit down at home and as we consider this great covenant of grace that we've been made partakers of, we often speak of our Lord's everlasting love to his people or of his eternal love, of our names having been inscribed in his eternal book and of Christ's having borne those names, us, from before the foundation of the world upon his breast as our great high priest. And in so doing, we have virtually called him El Gabor, the mighty God. Because as Spurgeon said, none but God could have been from everlasting to everlasting. As often as we profess the doctrine of election, we call Christ the mighty God. As often as we talk of the eternal covenant, so often do we proclaim him to be God, because we speak of him as an everlasting one, and none could be from everlasting, but one who is self-existent, who is God. Unquote. Third, we see him as mediator in the title Prince of Peace. Beloved, we believe this morning that Christ is the mediator between God and man. There is no co-mediatrix. There is no saint that can go before the Father for you, but Christ alone. And that's why I had us read from the Westminster Confession of Faith in our Confession of Faith this morning. But we are accustomed to say that Jesus Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. And so we offer our prayers to God through him, because we believe that he mediates between us and the Father. But I cannot put it better again than the Prince of Pre Preachers who said it this way, let it once be granted then that Christ is the mediator and you have asserted his divinity. You have virtually called him the Son of God, and you have granted his humanity, for he must put his hand upon both. Therefore, he must put his hand upon man in our nature. He must be touched with a feeling of our infirmities and be in all points like as we are. But he is not a mediator unless he can put his hand upon God. Unless, as fellow of the Eternal One, he shall be able without blasphemy to place his hand upon the divine being. 
There is no mediatorship unless the hand is put on both. And here's the question. Who could put his hand on God but God himself? Only God can put his hand on God, and yet Christ hath this high prerogative. For Mark, there is no mediatorship established. There cannot be unless the two are linked. If you wished to build a bridge, you might commence on this side of the river, but if you have not connected it with the other side, you have not built the bridge. There can be no mediatorship unless the parties are fully linked. Do you see, therefore, that in calling Christ mediator, we have, in fact, called him the mighty God? Beloved, how marvelous to consider the inherent glory of the mighty God in all of his attributes and all of his offices. How awesome that Jesus Christ, therefore, <clears throat> is proven to be the mighty God. And here, beloved, is the mystery of godliness and the very reason that today, this morning, we celebrate Christmas. Because the passage from which our text is taken today says, For to us a child is born. Child. What can a child do? What can little Ruby do sitting back there? A child wobbles when it walks. She stumbles when she falls. But more than that, more than just being a child, this child was born of a woman. Consider that. Seems obvious. We were watching a sermon this morning by one of our favorite pastors to listen to online. Shelby, you're our favorite pastor. No worries. <laughs> but to consider that every birth, we often hear, every child born is a miracle. No, they're not. There is nothing more natural than childbirth. But this child is supernatural. This child was conceived of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because this child is El Gibor, the mighty God. He was born an infant, nursing at his mother's breast, a babe deriving nourishment from a woman that he created. And is this even possible? Can this possibly be the God who works signs and miracles? And Isaiah says yes. For to us a child is born. And then he goes further. And he adds this. To us a son is given. So Christ was not only born. He was given. As man he is a child born, and as God, he is the Son given. He comes down from on high, and he is given by God. For what purpose? So that he might be our Redeemer. Because in God's providence, these two things are always put together. Bethlehem and Calvary. The cradle and the cross, the incarnation birth, and the atoning death. Beloved, this is the wonder of the incarnation that we celebrate this morning. His name, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. So is this child, this Son given to us then, not only to us, but to the whole world, actually El Gabor, the mighty God? Because if he is, beloved, then great is the mystery of godliness indeed. But what proof do we have? 
What proof is there to these claims? I mean, isn't that the question posed to us time and time again? Well, let's look very briefly at Scripture to see if there is evidence to substantiate this claim. This child born came into the world to destroy the wisdom of the wise so that we might destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And this son given came to destroy the works of the devil and in the process destroy him who has the power of death. For 33 years, he struggled and battled against temptations more numerous and more terrible than any man had ever faced before. Adam fell. Why? Because his wife tempted him. Eve fell because a serpent offered her some fruit. But Christ, the second Adam, stood unassailable against all the fiery darts of the devil. Although tempted in all ways as we are, although Satan did not spare one arrow out of the quiver of hell, Yet he, and he alone, was without sin. He stood face to face with, Sa with Satan in the solitude of the wilderness, hand to hand with him at the pinnacle of the temple, and side by side with him on the mountain. Yet he never wavered. Even when Satan gathered up all of his strength and assaulted him, our Savior, in the garden of Gethsemane and crushed him until he sweat as it were great drops of blood he did not falter but said nevertheless not as I will but as you will beloved Christ in all of his conquests over sin has established his Godhead he has shown himself to be Proven himself to be El Gibor, the mighty God. But you know what? This wasn't enough. Because these proofs might appear insufficient if he did not accomplish more than this. Because we know also that Christ proved himself to be El Gibor, the mighty God, from this proof also. That at last... All the sins of all of his people were gathered upon his shoulders. And as he was crucified, he redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. That is the tree of Christmas. And listen to this one last quote from Spurgeon as we draw to a close. The heart of Christ became like a reservoir in the midst of mountains. All the tributary streams of iniquity and every drop of the sins of his people ran down and gathered into one vast lake, deep as hell and shoreless as eternity. All these met, as it were, in Christ's heart, and yet... He endured them all with many a sign of human weakness, but with convincing signs of divine omnipotence. He took all our griefs and carried all our sorrows. The divinity within strengthened his manhood, and the wave after wave rolled over his head till he sank in deep mire where there was no standing. And all God's waves and his billows had gone over him, yet did he lift up his head as more than a conqueror. At length, he put the sins of his people to a public execution. They are dead. They have ceased to be. And if they, are, and if they be sought for, they shall not be found anymore. Forever. Unquote. Beloved, 
Jesus is El Gabor, the mighty God indeed. But he did even more than this. Because he died and he was placed in the grave. For three days, the cold chains of death seemed to hold him fast, but death could not hold him. And on the morning of the third day, he snapped those feeble chains and came forth. He came forth as the Lord of glory. He came forth as the mighty God. His flesh did not see corruption, for death had no claim on him whatsoever. And who else could be the death of death? Who else could be the plague of the grave? Who else could be the destroyer of destruction but El Gabor, the mighty God? So what do we do with all this? What do we say? To all of this. Dear ones, all who are present here this morning or may hear this at some point and are not Christian, I pray that God the Holy Spirit may give you a heart to believe. And I plead with you now, come. Come now and put your trust in Jesus Christ because he is El Gabor. Come to Christ and trust him, for he is the mighty God. Fall on your knees, confess your sins, and then cast your souls before his omnipotence. For he is able to save to the uttermost all that come to the Father by faith in him. And those here who are my brothers, adopted in Christ, beloved in the Lord, Believe in him now more than ever. Cast all your troubles on him because he is El Gabor. Trust in him and this mighty God will make a way for your deliverance from all your earthly cares. Take to him all of your sorrows and griefs for Jesus Christ alleviates every one of them. Tell him of all your backslidings and sins. For this mighty God has blotted them out, each and every one with his own blood. Because from the moment of his immaculate conception, in his marvelous incarnate birth that we celebrate this morning, throughout his earthly ministry and to the very moment he died, he was not manhood without divinity, nor was he divine without our frailty. But he was, and he is to this day, the mighty God. And although we so often focus upon the incarnation of Christ only on one day of the year, I say to you, beloved, that from this day forth and forevermore, this shall be our joy and our song, the child born and the Son given is to us, El Gabor, the mighty God. Let's pray. Our most merciful God and Father, we look this morning not only to the cross, but beyond the grave, to the throne of the Almighty King. He who rules and reigns now and forever, and yet for our sake, willingly became a babe in a manger. May we give you praise and worship you today. May we obey you and live and love you every day, because by your stripes we are healed. And may we worship you in spirit and in truth, because in all these things you have shown yourself to be the mighty God. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.